we have a problem, and we know about this problem for quite a while. Now we'll need your help to visualize this problem, all right? So it's going to be a bit interactive. How much do you think we're currently doing to leave this planet a healthier planet for our children? So take your hand, your left arm, and put it like this. If you're thinking we're doing right, just enough, take all your hands up. I want to see all your hands, your active participants in this poll. Put it here. If you're thinking we're not doing enough, put it here. If you're thinking, no, if you're actually thinking we're not doing enough here, if you're thinking we're doing way too much, put it up here. So just put your arm where you think it should be. All right, there, about there. Okay, freeze, freeze, look around. Now take your second arm and say, how much should we be doing? Okay, I, I don't even have to do this, Paul. So this is actually the problem I'm gonna try to explain. This is the one problem we have. This is where the world is. This is how much we should do. Now there's also a second problem, which I stumbled upon, not only one. And this problem you need to know, I have four kids and my daughter just turned 18 last week. And what you do when your kids turn 18 is you actually look at your old pictures and say, how was I when I was 18? So when I was 18, lucky me, this, was, this is actually a picture of me. Uh, um, I basically traveled the world. There was no COVID. Very sustainably, I took a train around the world. So I went to uh, Canada. I went to the US. I went through Mongolia. I went through the trans with the Trans-Siberian through actually Russia. And I went to China. And this is where I took the picture on top of the Chinese wall. So I don't know if you've ever been on the Chinese wall. Of course, yes, that's me. I had darker hair, had bigger t-shirts, and I thought I was really cool. But I actually was very intimidated being on this Chinese wall. It makes you make you feel very small. But this is what I've seen in Beijing. In Beijing, what I actually seen is when you go actually to Beijing, the first time I went, it's 30 years ago, I only saw bikes. Lots of bikes. Bikes, 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 bikes. The thing is, is when you're as old as I am and you go back 30 years later, what you actually see now is actually cars. This is Beijing. And that's the second problem which I need to share with you. Because the amazing thing most people don't know is China lifted 800 million people out of poverty. These people weren't taking bikes because it was cool or it was cardio. There were 800 million poor people. Most of them didn't have enough to eat. And over 50 years, China lifted this population to have enough to eat, to have the sneakers we have, the, the cars we have, the um, actually also the, the, the genes. But there's a side effect to it, and the side effect, you can actually see it, the side effect is massive pollution. If you've ever been to China or any of those fast developing areas, there's a massive pollution. And that's the second problem we have. The second problem we have is that we're currently 7.6 billion people on Earth. In 2050, we're gonna be 10 billion. And everybody wants to have the same standard of living. But you need to understand, we are in Nuremberg here. You in Nuremberg use 20 times more resources than somebody actually in Jakarta. Now I'm gonna ask you a moral question and I need your participation again. How many people do you think on earth have the same st standard of living as you have? This much or this much? Can, can you actually show this to me? Now my question is how much deserve to have the same standard of living as we do? Deserve. This much, right? Now, if we do the same thing, if we use the same amount of resources we are consuming, lifting everybody out of poverty, we will not have enough, have enough resources on Earth. It's a fundal, fundamental moral dilemma. We're already not doing enough, and there's a lot of people which we want to take out of poverty because they deserve it. So, the important part is, how do we lift people out of poverty without destroying our Earth? How do we basically not just look after ourselves, but make sure that everybody goes forward. So that's what I want to actually show, it, show you, is to basically say, what are three steps we can do, we all of us could do, to actually close this gap and use innovation. Innovation is going to be my superpower, as we talked about today, to do more with less. So I'm going to start with number one. And number one starts with all of you, right? All of you you have the power to use innovation to do more with less. And I'm going to give you one example. Look around. I mean, in the last 20 years, 15 years, all of you are using more electrical devices, more PCs, more smartphones. You are basically dependent on electricity. I'm going to ask you a question. 
in Germany, over the last 15 years, with all those new electrical devices, have we used 10%, 30%, 50% more electricity? 10% less. So we are already consuming 10% less electricity with many more devices, and it's much greener. So that's the key thing, and most people don't know this. So why is that? I actually sat in your chair and listened to a speech from somebody called Fuji Nakamura. So Fuji Nakamura is uh, very impressive. It's a professor. It's actually a professor here. You can see him. Um, Japanese origin, teaches in the US, and he invented the blue LED. So what's the blue LED? We had green LEDs, we had red LEDs. The blue LEDs basically enables you to build LED light bulbs. So I'll give you an example. If we would change all the light bulbs, the normal light bulbs, to blue LED or LED efficient light bulbs, we would save 800 million carbon tons of CO2 per year. Quite abstract. We learned that, right? I'll do it in percent. That's 2.2% of the worldwide emission of CO2. Still very abstract. It's the same thing than not having to use 680 coal powered plants, power plants. It's the same thing that if Germany would be carbon neutral like this in one go. So somebody in Japan inventing something basically gives the chance to have complete all of Germany to be carbon neutral. One idea, all of you use this. And this is where you with superpowers come into play. At the moment you think, I have nothing to do with it. You have something to do with it. If you shift your consumption from incandescent light bulbs to LEDs, you can have that impact. If you use thermostats in your home, 40% of worldwide energy consumption is in homes, and half of it is wasted. If you would do something about it, you have an impact. I'll give you another example. Everybody in this room, we're roughly 100 people. If you would, have you ever seen this one, this uh, energy sort of reading, yeah? If you, all of you would have a D fridge, if you have an old fridge, and you would buy the next time an A fridge, just 100 people in this room, we would save as much energy as five full households use in a year. So my first message is, is with innovation, you can be superheroes. You can have power to have an effect. And it's not the governments or others. It's you which can actually have this effect. So that's my first message. There's innovation out there. If you use it, you have an impact. Now, second one, industry. I do work for industry. I work with industry. What happens if industry uses innovation to do more with less? 30% of the worldwide energy consumption is used by industry. 30%. That's as much as if every car, every plane, every boat would stop and not pollute. So industry has huge responsibility to do something with this. I actually like to use, this is, um, I like Peter Parker, I don't know if you know Peter Parker, also called Spider-Man. With huge powers come huge responsibilities. So industry has a responsibility to do something about it. So the company I work with put a lot of effort in it, and we save 150 million tons of CO2 with the products we do by applying them with our customers. That's 0.4%, not as good as Shuji, but 0.4% of worldwide emissions. That's as if Netherlands would go and be carbon neutral. So Shuji has an impact, you have an impact, industry can have an impact. So how does industry do it? What is the industry superpower to do it? And we learned a lot about it early on. It's data. So industry at the moment is obsessed with data. So we're putting sensors in factories, for example, lots of sensors, heat, cooling, um, vibration. We put so many sensors, just to give you an idea, a factory which is connected produces 2,200 terabytes of data a month. That's roughly half a million Netflix movies which are produced by a single factory every month. So how many of you watch Netflix? It's not an advertising for Netflix, but perhaps three, five films, and it might make you more intelligent or less intelligent, I don't know, but for industry, it makes you more intelligent. Because if we use that data, we can do something which we call twins, digital twins. We can build a perfect replica of a physical environment in the virtual world. We use infinite data for the real world. Why? 
We actually use it to build replications of factories. We use it to build replications of trains. We do even replicas of shoes or cars. Why is that? Because if you have a replica in the virtual world, in the past, what you used to do, you used to build a car, you rode it again against the wall, and if it was not good enough, you built the next car, or you built it in clay. So you used a lot of resources to actually do it, and you were not efficient. What we're doing now is to use this data to simulate all of this to have the impact. There's a side effect. I don't know if you look at uh, BioNTech. BioNTech was capable of producing a vaccine within one year because it used data to virtually produce something. We can use the same power to reduce also impact on the world. How? I'll give you an, another example, a startup. So we have a bottle of water. All of you have some bottles in your, in your packs. These bottles tend to be sort of packed together in six packs. I don't know if you know, but six packs uses a lot of foil and a lot of electricity. So there's a startup called TrackRap. TrackRap used this digital twin idea to simulate how could this be built in a much more efficient way. They built a machine to do this, all in the virtual world. And what did they achieve? They were able to do a six pack with 90% less energy used and with 70% less foil. So the second thing is, industry can actually, using a superpower of data, use it to do more with less. That's the second message. And why I'm sharing with you. The first one, you make a decision to take an innovation and apply it. The second one, all of us are actually consumers. Whatever we as consumers want, industry will follow. So you have an impact by the choices of the product you take and the interaction you have. And all of you also work in some ways in an industrial or in another environment. So all of us, as I'm perhaps also Peter Parker, when I go as a consumer into my role in an industrial environment, I want to actually drive to do more with less. That's my second step. What's the third one? It's good that we use Shuji's invention. It's good that industry uses digital twins. But that's not enough. 2.2% or 0.4% will not bring us to the Paris Accord. So what do we need to do? So I watched one of those Netflix movies and they actually, I learned something from it. I don't know if you know a guy called Dirk Nowitzki. He's a German basketball player and he has a movie called A Perfect Shot. And it's very interesting. Because what you learn in there is that Dirk Nowitzki invented a shot called the fadeaway. So it's a fadeaway shot. Nobody could actually defend it. He was a superstar. So what happened? All the defenders learned on how to actually also do this shot and defend against it. But Dirk Nowitzki did the f a very interesting thing. He learned a different move every season. So he was ahead of his competition to be able to stay at the level he was. So why is that? There's a lot of good basketball players, but only the ones which continuously learn a new skill, a new step, a new capability have an impact and stay in the NBA. So that's what we need to do. So we need to learn a step every time. It's not good enough to just take an LED or it's not good enough to ask something from industry. What we have to do is one year, we'll decide to move all of the, our LEDs, our, all of our light bulbs to LEDs. Next year, we might want to actually use some intelligent thermostats. Next time, we might want to write to work. We can learn this every time. And every time we do one thing, because I shared with you, that is the gap, the, 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 the gap which we see. You cannot close this gap in one big invention. You have to get there by step, by step, by step, by step. So I'll give you one example. So there's the superpower in industry called data. How many of you would love to use data in your current job or in your personal life to make your house more efficient, to be more effective when you do some printing, to pay, perhaps run your bakery in a more effective way or your little industry? So how many of you are actually IT experts? Just to ra raise your hands. Okay, that's not bad. How many would love to be able to do that? A few more. There is something called low coding and no coding which basically means instead of having to program it, you can actually visibly take these elements together. So you can apply technology to be able to use the innovation to have the impact to do more with less. So that's one skill you could learn. You could define, I learned it, you could define to use basically low coding or no coding to do that. So the idea really is that you matter, that your choice matter, that it's not somebody else's problem, it's not government's problem, industry problem, somebody else's problem, it's your problem, our problem, to do the following thing. 
we have to do these three things. I basically owe it to my daughter that she can actually travel around the world once COVID is gone. But I own, own it also to the daughter of my friends in Africa, to the daughters of my friends in China, everywhere around the, around the world. So it's not a privilege which is just for the few. But in order to do this, we have to help. I'm not saying it's the only one, but I think that innovation is one element which we can do to help. By first, we as consumers are making the right choices. We are using these capabilities. Second one, we have a professional side also to us. We in industry, we running a bakery shop, we being in a professional environment or asking something are asking for also the right products, the right impact. And third, we continuously learn new skills to be able to do this. If we do these three things, and we should share it with each other, right? It's super important that we share it with each other. It's not something which we invent for ourselves. I'm sure the world has seen a lot of shujis and nobody has listened to them. Nobody has used their innovations. So what I wanted to share with you is that your decision matters. Your ideas matter. And if we do this, if we do this, we can do the following thing. And this was the, the, the actual animation. We can have not only one shuji saving 2.2% of global CO2. We can have two shujis, 10 shujis, 100, 1,000. So my feedback back to you is that we have a responsibility and we have a problem. We have a problem that we don't, and we are not doing enough for this world, and we have to take people out of poverty. We have to bring these two things together. We can do it, but not alone. We can do it together, and we can do it by taking these three steps. So I'm looking forward to work with all of you to do that. Thank you.